Okay, great. Welcome back. Time for the second half of this lecture that's about weather and climate, the first, you know, four pages or whatever of your textbook. Um, one of the points I want to stress is that, uh, you know, climate really is more than just the averages. Uh, knowing that the average temperature at some location on a particular day is, is whatever, or the average amount of rainfall they receive in July at this location is whatever, is definitely part of the story of climate, a big part of the story of climate. But actually, the average is only part of the story. I mean, we also need to know, for example, how much that average varies from year to year. If you live at a location that gets 20 inches of rain in an average year, that's an important piece of information. But it, the range is important, too. Um, if the range is from zero inches of rain some years to 50 inches of rain some years, then you actually have years where there's no rain at all, and years where, oh my goodness, 50 inches of rain in a year, is I mean, that's a torrential amount of rain. That would make a very big difference versus, let's say, you know that you, the range was 19 inches to 21 inches of rain per year. That would be very different information. You know, if you knew you could reliably count on right around 20 inches of rain per year, you might have information then about like what kind of crops you could grow in that area or what kind of uh, vegetation could live without irrigation in landscaping or something like that. Um, you know, whereas like if, if it's possible that you have, could go an entire year with no rain at all, you probably can't grow any kind of crops without irrigation at that location. The year-to-year -year variability is hugely important then. So is door trends. How is the average changing when you talk about like the average temperature at that location? Okay, over a period of decades, how has the average temperature changed? Over a period of decades, how has the average amount of rainfall each year changed? And so on. Trends matter. And that's an important part of what we talk about when we talk about climate. Now, to try to illustrate the importance of this idea of knowing about the variability and so on at location, your book decides to talk in the first couple of figures of the book about the climate of Fairbanks, Alaska. I'm not exactly sure why the author chose Fairbanks or whatever, and I've scanned in figure 1.1 in your textbook. Now, right off the bat, let me just tell you something that I found frustrating when I went through this. Unless I was just completely missing the point, it appears that... On, the, on page one, when he's describing figure 1.1, he seems to be talking about a different figure. I, I, maybe something went wrong. I, maybe I'm just not understanding it. It didn't have my coffee yet this morning. I don't know. But I was not understanding. He seems to be talking about a different figure altogether. So let's look at the figure I've scanned in and put up here. And we'll work with the figure that we have, not what he's talking about in the text. He seems to be talking about a different city or something like that uh, when he's uh, in the text there. Now, when you look at this figure here, the solid curve there is showing you the distribution of how often the low temperature was certain numbers. So, you know, like um, a certain percentage of the time the temperature was the low temperature in, I believe this is August, at Fairbanks, Alaska. A certain percentage of the time the low temperature was zero. A certain percentage of the time the low temperature was five, certain, you know, whatever, Celsius. Um, and the dashed curve is the same thing except for high temperatures. And so there is some distribution of, well, first off, there is some average high temperature in August in Fairbanks. It looks like it's about, I don't know, 66, 67, somewhere around there Fahrenheit. And that's an important number. But if you actually read across over there to the y-axis of this graph, you can see that, like, you know, that only corresponds to maybe about 9% of the time that that is, in fact, the high temperature on any given day in August. Um, over a long period of time, we found that that is not all that often that that is the high uh, temperature on that particular day and any particular day in August. Rather, on most days of, in August, the high temperature in Fairbanks, Alaska is either more than or less than that particular, uh, you know, average of 67 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever. Um, and that range, how that is shaped and how wide the tails of the distribution are and so on matters. I mean, for example, in this case, notice that the range is fairly limited. The high temperatures in August are hardly less, hardly ever less than 8 degrees Celsius, and they're hardly ever more than 32 degrees Celsius when you look at that curve. It's basically 0% of the time the high is greater than 32, or the low is great, less than 8. Now, that's still a pretty big range. I mean, that 8 degrees is right about 48 Fahrenheit, and 32 degrees is right around 90. I mean, that's a pretty big range there, but... You know, Fairbanks might not be very typical. Maybe other stations would have a narrower range or something like that. We can learn a lot about the climate of a location by understanding how the temperatures vary from year to year at that location. In the same way, 
the, the book then shows figure uh, 1.2, uh, which is showing you the distribution of, I believe it was daily low temperatures in August in Fairbanks. And again, in this case, the dashed curve is just showing you a, a what is that, about a 30 year period from 1945 to 1975, uh, showing you what the distribution of the low temperatures was. And then uh, with the solid curve, it's showing you from 1975 to, to 2009 what the distribution of the low temperatures were. And you can see that what the um, the lesson clearly here is that the the average low temperature in August has gotten warmer over the between those two 30 year periods, right? Uh, it looks like it's increased by a few degrees Celsius in that time period. The book actually gives you the exact number. I think it was like 1.6 degrees Celsius or something like that. And you could see that very warm temperatures like 15 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, what is 15 degrees Celsius? It's about 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, very, I mean, that's a low temperature in Alaska. That's a very warm low temperature in Alaska. And you can see that those are much more common now than they used to be. Actually, I zoomed in on that. I forgot I made a slide like this. Um, you can actually see that those temperatures have gotten much, much more common. If we look at 15 degrees Celsius and we read across on the dashed line, we see that, that a, a low temperature of as warm as 15 degrees Celsius used to happen about a half a percent of the time. Okay, almost never was there a low temperature in August that that warm. Okay, that would be an awfully warm night in Fairbanks, Alaska. On the other hand, in the later period, which is the solid curve, if we read up from 15 degrees Celsius, we can see that it happens something like 2% of the time. It, now, that's a lot more common. 2% is still not hugely common. It would still be a very unusually warm night in August if the low temperature was 15 degrees Celsius, but it's about four times as common as it used to be. Oh, see, the warming that has happened at, in this case, Fairbanks here, not only has it increased the average temperature, but it's made the extreme events, the very warm events, much more common. Literally like four times as common as they were before. That's interesting. Climate can give us all kinds of, climatology and the study of, of climate change and so on can give us all kinds of insights about how climate is changing and what it means and so on. That's what we're going to be doing this semester. We're going to be learning all about the importance of climate, and we're going to be learning about the kinds of processes that create and probably change climate both naturally and uh, as a result of human activities. But it's important to remember that the whole purpose of these first few pages of the textbook was to clarify the differences between climate and weather. Um, both are important. Now, the book... Little definition here is just that weather is the actual state of the atmosphere at a particular time, and that's kind of a handy little thing. And I like the little story that the textbook tells about the D-Day invasion at, uh, near the end of World War II. That's a classic story, actually, in atmospheric science about the role of uh, climatology and atmospheric science and weather and so on in planning the D-Day invasion. And make sure you you know review that and so on. That's a good story to know about the differences between weather and climate. But keep in mind, I mean, weather is much more, more rapidly changing, it's much more, a good word is stochastic, random. Okay, it's, it's still caused by the laws of physics and all that kind of stuff, but it is much more chaotic, it's much uh, more rapidly changing. As you're looking at this satellite loop up here, you can see how things are, the storms are passing, they're changing in all kinds of complicated ways. This is weather. At any given location, from hour to hour, the weather is different. That doesn't mean that the climate is different from hour to hour. If we had this satellite loop for years and years and years and we could study it, we could see, oh, look, this location tends to be cloudier and this location tends to be clearer and so on. We could learn a lot about the climate of the region over a very long period of time, but weather is a rapidly changing, chaotic system, okay? Um, much more difficult to forecast than climate and so on, as we'll learn later in the semester. So weather and climate are both very important. I'm an atmospheric scientist. You're not going to uh, get me telling you that they're not important. Um, but they're going to, in general, be uh, discussed in terms of different tools. We're going to learn very different things in this course, which is exclusively about climate and climate change, than if you decide to stick around for ATS 113 and learn about um, Introduction to Atmospheric Sciences, where that's a lot about weather. In this class, we're going to be talking about things like global warming. Um, that's going to be primarily like desertification, the growth of deserts, and so on. Uh, whereas, like in ATS-113, we're going to be learning about things like tornadoes or cold fronts or something like that. 
very different kinds of tools are going to be used in to understand climate problems versus what are going to be used to discuss uh, weather problems like forecasting and so on. Okay, just to wrap up then this quick lecture here, let's do two more questions uh, that kind of will give you a hint about the kinds of things that I can ask on the upcoming um, quiz. Question three, climate change can result in higher average temperatures overall, but it can also make extreme events, you know, like unusually warm or unusually cold periods, A, much less common, or B, much more common. Hmm, okay, there's only two choices here. Um, Go ahead, think about it, and then pick from one of the two links below this embedded video. You'll get a little feedback before you move on to question four.